Welcome to another episode of the Blockchain Scholars Podcast. And thank you to our sponsor VeChain for their continued support. Today's guest is one of the most well-known professors in corporate finance globally. He holds a PhD in economics and a JD from Harvard. And he published in all important academic publications of the field, including Journal of Finance and Journal of Financial Economics. Over the years, he's amassed over 30,000 citations. And since 1994, he's with NYU, where he's a professor of finance and business transformation. I believe he wrote the most cited paper on ICOs that has been published in RFS and also a great introductory paper on blockchain and corporate governance published in the Review of Finance. I first met our guests at a seminar at Erasmus University where he talked about digital currencies and blockchains. Uh, I believe that was in 2019 and um, he introduced various papers with the PhD candidates. Welcome to the Blockchain Scholars Podcast, Professor Dr. David Jamek. So the first question today is what's the title of your new paper? And what kind of research question are you really trying to answer with that paper? Yeah, the, the title is Bitcoin Meets Wall Street. I was first interested in the fact that you had a lot of Bitcoin mining companies listing on the NASDAQ stock exchange alongside the copper mining and gold mining and aluminum mining companies. And they were trying to attract investors to invest in an activity that boils down to trying to guess random numbers very quickly. Um, blockchain mining is actually a very simple endeavor where you do trial and error calculations to try to complete a puzzle. And the people who are good at this are the people with the fastest computers, but there's no particular skill or value added. And I said, this is really like investing in the lottery and person who's going to win the lottery is whoever can buy the most tickets the quickest. And it just struck me as very odd that you would organize this as a publicly traded corporation for risk sharing purposes. You know, it just didn't seem to fit the classical model. But we've now got dozens of these firms in the US. Many of them are quite small, but a few of them are, you know, quite valuable and have been rather successful at becoming major players in crypto mining. And the more we learned about it, we learned that it was really about access to energy and in particular, certain districts of the United States, Texas standing out among them, that have tried to attract the industry to their jurisdiction as an indirect way of subsidizing green energy projects, wind power and solar power and so forth. So mm -hmm. there's actually an environmentally friendly story associated with this project that we didn't really anticipate before we got into it. Okay, interesting. Would you describe the paper more as an empirical paper or is it more a theory paper? Where, where would you kind of look? Definitely an empirical paper. You know, we, mm -hmm. we try to understand which companies are the most valuable. What are the forces behind that value? What helps them stand out from one another? And again, it seems to be the access to energy that differentiates them. And they've been very proactive about negotiating contracts with the local governments and utilities and so forth to try to get a comparative advantage against one another. Okay, interesting. And were you able to use any specific data or was it just based on public data that, that's available to anyone? The companies themselves put out monthly reports about how many coins they've mined and how much capacity they've built out into the network. So the key statistic is called the hash rate, which is simply how many calculations you can do per second. and it's measured in like quadrillions per second. You know, these calculations come very, very quickly, but essentially the faster your hash rate, the more coins that you should be able to mine. And so companies have been giving monthly updates of what is their installed hash rate? What do they forecast it to be based on orders that they put with the hardware suppliers? And how many coins did they actually win? And you can compare what they won with what they should have won given the size of their footprint and then understand some of the aspects. They, they end up shutting down during periods of high energy demand because of their agreements with the utilities. You can get into some of those details, but these reports are not mandatory in any sense that as public companies, they simply have to report quarterly financial statements, but they're giving these monthly updates. And I just began to collect them all and build a data set you know, we've now got about two years of these with about a dozen companies. So there's several hundred of them and that's our main data source are these, um, they're public documents, but they're really not 
organized anywhere in a central source. So we did that work ourselves. I did obviously uh, did a little peek into the document uh, before before our call, and I realized there's also one company in the data set that is that has failed, right? Can there's you... one in bankruptcy, and mm -hmm. when these companies are successful, they're paid in Bitcoin. The rewards that they win are in Bitcoin, and during 2021 and 22, we had this period called the crypto winter where Bitcoin mm -hmm. dropped about 70%. And this was rather devastating for the economics of some of these companies. And so one of them ended up in chapter 11 bankruptcy. It's actually, I think, coming out very shortly, but many others became unprofitable and financially distressed, had to renegotiate their debt and so forth. And this was really largely because the payment in Bitcoin lost roughly 70% of the face value from peak to trough. It has since recovered quite a bit. Um, Bitcoin has more than doubled during 2023. Yeah. And so a lot of these companies look much better today than they did at the start of the year if they were able to ride out the financial storm. And most yeah. of them were. Interesting. And um, with regards to the business model of these companies, effectively, you have to, I don't know, look at um, how much it costs you to mine one Bitcoin. And then if you can do that below the market price, you're profitable. Is, is that as, as simple as it is? Or? Yeah, that's exactly right. But the, the cost is a little bit tricky because you have a variable cost of energy, but there's also a fixed cost of real estate, the utility connection, and especially the hardware and then a connection or a question of how quickly to scrap and replace the hardware as faster models become available. It's um, it's not the simplest capital budgeting problem in the world. In fact, it's one I've been looking at for years with my students in class, that if you're an entrepreneur in this space, you're dealing with a lot of uncertainty, not the least of which is that your revenue is in Bitcoin, but your expenses are in US dollars. And so you have a very tricky hedging problem. Mm -hmm. But um. Getting access to the fastest hardware is pretty important in the long run. There's one manufacturer in China called Bitmain that supplies most of the market. And to be in their order book, it's a little like being in the order book of Boeing and Airbus for commercial aircraft. You know, there's only a limited number of machines and your place in the queue is very important. But the cost then, you you know, invest a lot of money in hardware and you're going to amortize that over months or maybe even a couple of years of operation. So a lot of these firms, they, they report, of course, the official GAAP financials, the generally accepted accounting principles, but they've all got their own versions of what they think their costs are. And they exclude a lot of things that the auditors would ordinarily put in. And so it's a little bit hard to take that with a straight face. You know, they all say that they're crazy profitable, but most of them are not because they have all this fixed overhead costs that they're not necessarily covering. I suppose um, a good treasury function is then also quite essential, right? Because you have to make that decision when to perhaps hold on to the Bitcoin or when you want to. When you yeah, wanna... I mean, that to me is one of the fascinating things, because if you look at a mining company that mines gold or aluminum, they sell into the market pretty much as soon as it comes out of the ground. They don't yeah. pile up mountains of aluminum and speculate in it. But you've definitely seen different strategies that some of these people really are in two businesses. They mine Bitcoin and then they hang on to it for you know speculative purposes. Yeah. And if you pile up a big enough inventory, you really start to look like a Bitcoin ETF. You know, that the people who invest in the stock are really investing in your inventory. It's a cheap way to acquire Bitcoin as opposed to the success of your mining operation. But some of the companies that were doing that, when the prices dropped and they became financially distressed, they had to unload their inventories at fire sale prices. And you could see yeah. that they were very reluctant, but they had no other way to raise cash. Um, I think that cycle has now reversed and some of them are now accumulating Bitcoin, especially this one company called Marathon that is at this point, I think the industry leader, they have a big mountain of Bitcoin that itself has been the focus of some recent media coverage. Hmm, interesting. Okay. And um, since we are recording our sessions for practitioners in the finance industry, what would you say are some of the key takeaways from your paper and, and what, you know, how would they have to interpret your results in their daily lives? Can you talk a little bit about that? 
the relationship with the electric utility is critical. Um, the successful companies are operating in Texas and using wind power. And the problem with wind power is simply that it's not windy every day and that there are some days where there's an abundance of wind, other days when there's none. And so the Bitcoin mine has to be prepared to deal with the uneven availability of energy, but they're paid for doing this, that they they serve an important role of being a buffer and that they take up the excess supply of wind power when there's moderate weather, but a lot of wind, but on very hot or very cold days where there may not be much wind, but there's high demand, they agree to shut down. In fact, on 15 seconds notice, we were told by the people at Marathon, but wow. they're paid for doing this. And on very hot days, they can also sell their energy back to the grid. So they're making money partly by being good at mining, but also by providing this buffer role called load balancing for the utilities. And the conclusion we came to is really that the utility should own the crypto mine. That, you know, this is a way for them to even out the demand and it gives stability to the market that encourages the construction of green energy. That um, the whole strategy of Texas is predicated on giving the wind power suppliers a guarantee of steady demand. And because the Bitcoin people can connect or power down on a moment's notice, they're able to play that role in the market. So they're compensated for being a buffer between supply and demand. And you know that's the fundamental economics that are going on here. Bitcoin gets criticized all the time for the energy burn, but this is really the opposite where they're providing a service by um, enabling green energy providers to count on a stable demand and then construct more capacity than otherwise would be available to the market. But is the business model compatible with a utility company that usually is, you know, the, the, the stock price volatility of a utility company is rather you know, not so volatile compared to whatever happens in, in the crypto Yeah, market. I think it depends on the fuel that the utility is burning. And I believe that the volatility of renewable energy can be rather higher depending on where it's located and what, you know, if you're using hydropower next to Niagara Falls, that's a pretty stable supply. But wind power in the Texas desert is pretty seasonal. And mm -hmm. there's actually very good data on this from the Texas Energy Regulator about, um, you know, the days of production and the consumption. We were able to get access to that. And to oversimplify a little bit, it's windy in the spring and the fall, but the high demand is in the winter and the summer. So there's a real mismatch in this market between supply and demand. I think this is known to the investing public, so it's not necessarily a surprise, but certainly your operating results are going to be much more unstable than a coal fired plant or a nuclear plant where it's pretty much the same thing every day. Texas is an interesting location because they've isolated themselves from the other 49 states. And, you know, this is an interesting story in its own right, but Texas has a self-contained energy market where they can't balance supply and demand by importing from the other states which everybody else has been doing for a long time. You know, they think they can do this better, but it's much more important for them to have stabilization of demand than it might be, you know, in the state of New York or Illinois or any other place. Oh, that makes sense. Um, if you look ahead, um, what do you think are the doors that this paper opens for other researchers to perhaps build on your work and, and investigate further? It's an interesting question. The, um, the trend in crypto is actually to move away from proof of work mining altogether, to go to proof of stake, as we've seen with Ethereum and many of the newer projects. But I do think proof of work is going to continue to be important. And there's a lot of niches of this market that are still unexplored. The um, time sharing of energy, the use of cloud computing computers at big tech companies like Google and Facebook. Um, I would expect if crypto and Bitcoin in particular continues to grow more valuable, you're going to see entry from other competitors who have their own sources of energy. It's the big tech companies that have always intrigued me because if I'm a retail operation like Amazon, I've got customers online until about 11 p.m. and then they all go to bed and my machines are probably pretty quiet until they wake up the next morning. Why not yeah. use those machines, point them at the blockchain and mine crypto? And that would be a load balancing strategy, not unlike what you're seeing in Texas. 
So I think um, there's a lot of attention to um, conserving energy and rationalizing the use of the capacity that we now have. And I think it's interesting that proof of work mining can be a buffer, not just for Texas wind companies, but for the industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. And um, I would expect that these interactions are going to become more and more interesting and will go beyond Texas to to other parts of the world that also are interested in building out wind power and solar power and so forth. Maybe one last question to wrap up. Um, of course, when we talk about cryptocurrencies and blockchains, the word decentralization comes to mind. Um, any thoughts on decentralization in the context of the research that you did on these mining companies? Yeah, in fact, you can see it very vividly here because these mines are data centers and they are constructed spontaneously around the world by entrepreneurs. Some of them in our data set happen to be in places like Sweden and Chile and so forth, okay. where somebody has made cheap energy available, but the decision to open it is completely up to the entrepreneur and there's no central capital budgeting function like a bank would have to say we need a new data center. So I've always been impressed by how these data centers pop up in China, in South America and you know all kinds of parts of the world. And it's done completely spontaneously without any central coordination. In fact, often with a degree of rivalry between them. But um, it's amazing to me that all of this is coordinated by signals about the market price of Bitcoin, the prices of energy, the prices of the hardware, all of which are sort of um, computed in the mind of the entrepreneur and you know they either decide to expand or exit the market or whatever but it's all completely atomistic and each of these are small players in a big market making their own profit maximizing decisions and they end up with an outcome that looks a lot like the footprint of jp morgan or barclays but it's completely decentralized and you know ultimately they add and subtract capacity based on market forces and signals from the price system. It's the kind of thing that Hayek would have loved about, you know, the use of knowledge as it impounded in market prices and so forth. And is there is there not a risk because the companies are relatively small compared to JP Morgan? There are risks that you get over expansion um, or even not enough capacity so that these systems could be vulnerable to attack. but. Yeah. There are definitely risks in the other direction. Banks also overexpand and get stuck with fixed costs that they can't afford. And it's not obvious that a big bureaucratic corporation can make these decisions better than small competitors responding to market prices. Fair. Great. David, thank you so much for your time today. I think it was a really interesting conversation and I'm, I recommend to everyone obviously to read the paper. I'm sure we'll, we'll see it pop out in a rather prominent outlet as you as you used to do with your other works uh, thank you very much for being here with us today okay thank you daniel i appreciate the invitation to come on thank you very much for tuning into the blockchain scholars podcast and also thank you very much to vchain for their support if you like our content please follow us on youtube and linkedin and introduce us to colleagues friends and anyone else who you think might benefit 